Hello, I'm Dr. Mike Miller, and I'm the Director of Microbiology Technical Services, which is a private consulting service for diagnostic laboratories around the country. I'm also retired from the Center for Disease Control after 35 years, and I've had a lifelong interest in specimen management and clinical relevance. Now there are a lot of references that are available for you in this regard and one has been produced by the American Society for Microbiology and there are many others that are available to you. So I want to welcome you to this most informative series of demonstrations of specimen collection for diagnostic microbiology. As we all know, receiving the appropriately collected specimen in the laboratory is absolutely essential in order for the laboratory to do its work. Now we want to ensure that the medical staff doing the collecting also know how important it is. This video series can provide some of the support you need to keep your staff informed. So before we launch into actually collecting specimen, let's do a quick review of what is really important and what tools are available for specimen collection. One common specimen collection tool is the urine cup and there are a variety of these cups. Urine is an otherwise sterile body fluid and even that concept may be changing, so we need to have a sterile container with a tight fitting lid to submit this specimen. Urine is one specimen that patients may collect themselves with careful instructions. Think twice about sending liquid specimens to the laboratory through pneumatic tube systems. The needle and syringe is a valuable collection device to aspirate the contents of abscesses, to remove samples from various tubing ports, to retrieve various body fluids such as spinal fluids and joint fluids and other uses. Needles, however, should not be recapped. So if the syringe is to be sent to the lab after the specimen is collected, discard the needle properly replace the protective syringe cap if it's available and send the syringe to the lab without the needle. Various scrapers are used to collect specimens from skin lesions for fungal infections or scraping the cornea for certain eye infections. Surgical scalpels provide tissue for analysis which is far better than receiving a swab sample from the same infected site. Now there are various suction devices and tubes that are used daily to aspirate fluids and specimens from body sites. We all know that the swab is the workhorse of specimen collection, but first let's get one thing straight. A swab may or may not be the method of choice for collecting and submitting that specimen. One of the first rules of specimen collection is that the specimen must represent the disease process. In fact, we want a specimen in the laboratory, not a swab of a specimen. Here we have a tiny mini tip swab, which is often used as a nasal pharyngeal swab, and it's likely to hold only 15 thousandths of a milliliter of material, 0 0.015 milliliters. Now, next to that is a routine swab that's much larger and likely to hold 10 times the amount of the mini tip swab, like 0 0.15 milliliters. Next, we have a needle and syringe that can aspirate a measured volume at least 10 times what the regular swab can hold, in this case, one and a half milliliters. And then finally, we have the actual specimen here showing more than 15 milliliters of material. Now, which of these specimens is likely to be more productive to find an etiologic agent from an infectious disease patient. The larger the volume of specimen, the more likely we are to find the culprit causing the disease. Now look at the variety of conventional swabs available. Traditionally, the swab may be made of cotton, Dacron, or alginate. The flock swab is made of nylon fibers. But even these swab types have limitations. For instance, aerobic bacteria can be successfully recovered from either of the four types of material. But for optimal recovery of anaerobic bacteria, the laboratory would prefer not to receive any swab. Rather, we need the tissue 
or aspirate submitted in anaerobic transport. But if a swab is to be used for anaerobic bacteria, the e-swab is the preferred transport system. Chlamydia can be recovered from Dacron or alginate, but not cotton. Actually, the cytobrush is the specimen of choice for chlamydia, not a swab, and certainly none with wooden shafts. Swabs are not recommended at all for the recovery of fungi. Viruses can be recovered using cotton or Dacron, but not alginate. Again, no wooden shafts and no charcoal in the transport container. Swabs will continue to be sent to the lab despite some of their limitations. In spite of our best efforts to educate, swabs will continue to be a vehicle for collecting and transporting samples. This being the case, we need to advocate the best type of swab technology and proper collection. Part of the limitation mentioned before is due to the fact that conventional swabs are tightly wrapped and form a mattress core where the majority of the sample remains trapped. In 2004, a highly effective swab called flock swab was invented by Copan. Now, flock swabs release more than 90% of the sample, as opposed to traditional swabs, which release as little as 10% of the sample. Now, notice how different these fibers appear on the swab where the flock swab is not wrapped at all but the nylon fibers project out from the surface of a molded applicator in a perpendicular fashion resulting in a velvet brush-like texture. The literature has shown that bacteria and viruses are released better from the flocked swab by elution, leading to higher concentrations for culture and rapid direct testing and molecular assays. Flock swabs combined with liquid transport media, for instance, e-swab for bacteriology and UTM for virology, have been shown in the literature to be effective for aerobic and anaerobic bacteria, as well as viruses, mycoplasma, and ureaplasma. Remember when we said the laboratory prefers a specimen, not a swab of a specimen? Well, if a swab is used, we should encourage the use of the best performing swab, a flock swab with either bacteriology or virology transport medium. Look at this delicious chocolate muffin. Wouldn't you like to have a taste? Okay, here are your options. Take a bite out of the real thing or after I dip a swab into this muffin, how about trying the sample of the muffin? Now, which one is representative of what the muffin really tastes like? Don't stick a swab in an otherwise wonderful specimen and send it to the lab expecting wonderful results. The value of what you get depends on the value of what you send. So the question arises about validating swabs in the lab prior to their use. Here's the deal. If the swab is specifically recommended for use in an FDA-approved kit or test, and if you wish to change the swab from the approved one, you would need to do an in-house validation. If you're changing a swab for culture, one should not assume that all manufacturers' collection systems perform to the same level. Now, while it is not required, it is prudent that labs contemplating any change in swab perform an in-house validation following the CLSI M40A2 guidelines. Now, this was just a brief review of the common specimen devices that we see in the lab daily, but the resulting specimen remains the most important component of our microbiology laboratory testing. It must be appropriately selected, collected, and transported before we can supply the doctor with results that are accurate, significant, and clinically relevant. If we can't do that, then we offer no value to patient care. So 
Let's spread the word.